Okay. Everyone, gasho. Gasho. Welcome. It is precisely uh, two o'clock in Wales. Uh, we are right on time today to welcome uh, Taikyo David Morgans, uh, our uh, very dear uh, brother and uh, old friend uh, for many years. Thank you. Get a little closer to the camera for a second. We want to say hi. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Hang on. There. You're way over there. Yeah. Get get get, get close. So how you doing, yeah. my friend? What are you up to? Uh, you know, getting on with it. Just yeah. uh, just getting on with it. Good. Are, yeah. I'm you know doing what I was <laughs> what I was doing two two or three years ago. Still doing the same things, really. I, I now I, I heard um, uh, from Mioza last week. You just came back. Was it France? You were teaching in France. Yeah, I was in Zen River for a while. Then I came. I went to France with Taigo for a dining's retreat. Oh. Then I got back. Um, I left in the middle of July and, and came back in August. And then that was that was that was good. A good experience. Very good. Now, now, how do you say Zen in Welsh? I have no idea. I don't speak Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta ask your wife. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can. There's. Um, you gotta realize that in Wales there are two areas: South Wales and North Wales. Okay, and West West Wales as well. But not uh, South East Wales is and South Wales is very kind of anglicized. You know Cardiff and the valley I the valley I was born in. My parents, my parents, my father spoke Welsh, but my mother was from London, so she didn't oh, there, she didn't speak Welsh. There you go. There you go. But uh, yeah, so in South Wales is if you unless you go into the valleys, you don't get much Welsh speaking. North Wales is different, and West Wales there's quite a lot of Welsh speakers. So where I am now, there's a lot of Welsh speakers. My wife whose parents are from Manchester. So she's English by, by kind of blood, by genes. She, they, he, she and her parents moved down here before, just before she was born, and she went to a Welsh-speaking school. So she learned Welsh. Ah. So, um, but I never did. So she was able to translate the sitting bit for you, but I, but I, but <laughs> but I couldn't understand what it, was, what it said. Now, now, how is the, the state of uh, Zen in Wales, and, and how, how is uh, you, you're, you've got your, your Sangha, uh, how is it going? Yeah, we, we have a, we have a, a Sangha in uh, the university, and we get students to come along, but mostly they're local people. And now we're also setting up a Zen, as you saw, Zao, which is a Zen association of Wales, where we're trying to Trying to kind of promote Zen throughout Wales, there is not a there's not there are a, a, one or two temples in Wales, Zen Wales, but they belong to they're affiliated with um, Throssell Hall, but they're very small temples. One one priest I think, or one priest and her pupil uh, is in one of them, and there's one priest in another. But Zen in Wales is kind of, it's, there's a, I think there was a quite a large Chan movement in Wales. They've got a lovely uh, retreat center somewhere in mid Wales. But other than that, there's very little kind of uh, Zen going on. So we're promoting it in Lampida, it's thriving. I, I think you also need to get a prize for best acronym of any Zen Sangha I've ever heard. I just want to have a Sangha called Zao. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that. My son did. So, so it was, uh, he, th he thought of that. And I thought, yeah, that, that's, that's got a nice ring in it. I want to ask you that at the, at the university. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's only, it's yeah, at the university, they Sorry. know you're. Uh, they know you're a Zen priest, and they're open to it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Walk around the campus in robes and stuff. We they give us the zendo, and there is. Uh, we have a, a link with the Pulan Buddhists in um, in China and Hong Kong, 
which is quite, uh, they are forming links with the university for interfaith links. And so I was, uh, I was, I met all the kind, there's a, they met in the master, I can't remember his name now, this, uh, this Pure Land Buddhist thing, an interfaith kind of movement. And I met him a few times, but the universities, you know, they, they kind of uh, dragged me out as the token Buddhists. They say, right, we're going to meet the Chinese, can you put your robes on? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. They, they're, quite, they're quite comfortable with the whole thing. As I said, they gave us the Zendo. We were sitting in, we were uh, having rooms in the university, taking classrooms, you know, to sit in. And then we asked them for a room and they gave us a Zendo, which is on the top floor of the uh, Theology and Religious Studies building, which is, 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 you know, it's quite nice. It's kind of right up in the, in the, in the sky, you know, so, but uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's a good place. Lovely. Uh, I'm very happy to say uh, Taigu uh, uh, is uh, also going to come for a Zazen Kai and just uh, kind of refresh your course uh, sometime uh, soon, but it'll probably be after the new year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, after, uh, let me, yeah, let me he said, uh, he told me. Uh, let me suggest we sit now for about 25 minutes and then we'll uh, uh, have your talk. It's a shame uh, mm -hmm. you, you finally got here. Shugen uh, had a, an entire talk ready on Zen and Wittgenstein. If you hadn't, ah. just, <laughs> unfortunately, we're not going to get a chance to hear it. So I'll ring the bell and we'll sit for about uh, 25 minutes if that's okay. Okay, good. Okay.
As uh, soon as uh, Taikyo gets settled, I'll ask Kyonin to recite the verse to uh, open the sutras, and then we'll have a talk with Taikyo. The Dharma incomparably profound and infinitely subtle is always encountered yet rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma incomparably profound and infinitely subtle is always encountered yet rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma incomparably profound and infinitely slow is always encountered yet rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, receive and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. Okay. Are you ready? Is everybody okay? Can you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> right. Um, okay. I want to. When I when Jandu asked me, I didn't know what I was going to talk about, but um, I've been uh, I've been involved in a kind of bit of a project lately. Uh, since going to Zen River, I've got interested in, um, they practice in Zen River, they practice um, uh, koan practice, as well as, you know, uh, Shinkantasa. So they practice koan uh, practice. And um, I, I got interested in this when I was there. And I, I, I kind of tried to think about you know what what a koan is what a koan is what what is it you know in terms of you know i looked at it given that i'm a philosopher i looked at it philosophically you know in one sense but then i wanted to know what you know what the kind of difference is between soto zen and uh, rinzai in t in terms of just the koan practice so i i i, I and um taigo <laughs> taigo sent me off reading kind of the uh, Karako and uh, the the two Dharmarai. And so I've been reading a lot of um, a lot of uh, Dogen's work on koans. But also um, I've been working on a, on a for a long time I've been working on this uh, on the um, uh, the Hokkyo uh, Zan, Zanmai, the uh, precious song of the precious mirrors of Samadhi. And I just wondered how that tied in with some of the kind of things that were, you know, or were practiced in, in koan practice. But what, what struck me uh, in reading through it was the kind of, funnily enough, reading the, the, the way that the um, Hokkyo Zan, uh, Zanmai it fits in with with uh, a, a fascicle, the 20, um, 28 ninth fascicle in the in the Nishijima uh, interpretation of Shobogenzo, it fits in with the um, fits in with with the the Inmo and the Hoka Hoka Yosanmai fit in together. They fit they fit in some way, and that got me looking at a number of things and the connection with Dogen. And the and the Chan tradition, you know, the Chinese tradition, 
and where that comes from. And it's very interesting because in the in the uh, in the the uh, the song of the precious Nera Samadhi and and in Inmo and in um, a number of other texts, they play back to one particular sutra, uh, the the Sunagama Sutra, which uh, is an interesting one. So today the talk will be about a little bit about linking the Hoko San, Zanmai with Inmo and a kind of look back at uh, or look back at the ch what the Chan masters were saying and th this particular sutra and and how that works out and what it focuses on in more as you probably know it means uh, that in the uh, Nishijima tra cross translation it's it but it's also um, it's also translated as suchness or or thusness and it's also translated as being so 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 but I like the I like the Nishijima translation because I like this idea of it. I just like this it business, you know, because that little word is such a small word in relation to how it's used. And it must be used thousands and thousands and thousands of times during a conversation in, in a day. Uh, but in, in the Hokyo uh, Sanmai and in Inmo, there is this, this play on it which is a really interesting play for us, for, for sort of Zen practitioners, because it harps back to a, pra a Chinese Chan practice. You know, it, it links back to that, where, where kind of sort of Zen focuses on. So it's, it's a way of bringing together the koan practice. What I'm, see what I'm looking at is bringing together the koan practice without koans, without koans, to, to Shinkantaza. Okay, so so I'm just going to go through a few lines of the uh, the um, uh, the Hokkyo Zanmai, and then I'm going to look at some of the passages in Inmo, and then and then look at this sutra, what it says in the sutra, and then go go to these two uh, two Chan masters who were who interestingly pick it up. So let me just read a little bit of the uh, of the. Hokia Azanmai. And if those who are interested, if there's any people interested out in Wittgenstein out there, as Junda said that um, there were people interested in Wittgenstein. Some of this, uh, some of the, the, the stanzas here relate very closely to kind of the later philosophy of Wittgenstein. You want to say the, the, relation, uh, the relationships between language and nothingness, the relation between what language can say and what it can't say. You know, and this, this, uh, the Hokio Zanmai is very much focused in a number of its standards on that kind of relationship. Anyway, okay. Uh, the Dharma of thusness is intimately transmitted by Buddhas and ancestors. Now, I'm, I'm going to emphasize the it in this so you can see it, okay? Because we often talk, as I said, we often talk about it. The Dharma of thusness is intimately transmitted by Buddhas and ancestors. Now you have it, preserve it well. So you can see, even from that line, now you have it, what do you have? And what do you kind of preserve in terms of our practice? You know, remember uh, 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 Tozan or Dongchan was, was relating this to a, to a student of his. So it's both a letter uh, of transmission of now you've had transmission, but it's also an open letter to the rest of the community. So, so now you have it, preserve it, it well. Is very telling. I mean, what is it that we have? What is it that we need to preserve? He goes on a silver bowl filled with snow and heron hidden in the moon. Taken as similar, they are not the same. Not distinguished, their places are known. Now. But in, in, the, in the first bit of this, that seems not to fit very well in one sense. But the whole conversation, it seems to me, in, in this poem is between, you know, because you know Don Chan wrote the, the, the five ranks as well, is the kind of um, play, the interrelationship between this ultimate it and this conditioned us, you know, uh, and how we how we kind of negotiate that kind of relationship. 
So taken as similar, they are not the same, not distinguished, their places are known. The meaning does not reside in the words, but a pivotal moment brings it forth. So, <laughs> we, yeah, there's the Wittgenstein for you, if you like. Taken as similar, they are not the same. The meaning does not reside in the words, you know, and but pivotal moment brings it forth. You know, it reminds me of that wonderful Kitagari kind of paradox where he, one book is returned to silence, in other words, shut up, and the other book is, well, you have to say something. And, uh, and that's what, you know, even this talk is about. It's about saying something that really can't be said. And again, there's your Wittgenstein. It, move and you're trapped, miss and you fall into doubt and vacillation. Now that, that kind of, uh, that stands out, it's, is, is very important when it comes to Inmu. Because it's talking about this kind of practice that we do. You know, move and you're trapped. Well, you cannot move. And miss and you fall into doubt. And what, what is there to miss? And what is there to hit? You know, so th this whole thing is a, is a kind of paradox and a mystery in that way. And it's the mystery that surrounds this kind of it. Moving your trap, missing you fall into doubt and vacillation. Turning away and touching are both wrong, for it is like a massive fire. Turning away and touching are both wrong. You can't do anything here. You know, uh, you move and you're trapped, you miss and you fall into doubt and, and vacillation. Turning away and touching are both wrong, for it is like a massive fire. You can't do anything here. There is nothing to gain in this it. And it's, that's really important message from Dongshan, I think. You know, this is a very, imp you know, we can't, we can't make this happen in any way. You can't talk it into it being. You can't describe it in, in words. You can't do anything to bring it about. It's always present. You know, it's, it is always present. Just to portray it, in literary form is to stain it with defilement. Now, I think what he means by that is very simple, is that we can do all the talking we want. There's nothing against talking because Dong Chen would be, this would be the paradox of Dong Chen. Of Don Chen, he's writing it down, but he's saying you can't put it in literary form. So, you know, the paradox is there again. And this paradox is all, again, always in, in the koan kind of practice, this paradox of trying to work out from the words what's there and having to leave the words and go somewhere else, you know, trying to find out what's going on and breaking your head against trying to find it out when you, there is nothing to find out because you can't do anything, uh, you can't do anything about it. So he says just to portray it in literary form is to stain it with defilement. You can't just talk. You can talk about it, but you must practice. You can talk about it, but you must practice. Just talking about it is no good at all. In the darkest night, it is perfectly clear. In the light of dawn, it is hidden. Uh, you know, I, I read, I don't know how many commentaries I read on, the, on, this, on this poem, but it's kind of, the, you know, the way that people talk about this is, is kind of in different ways. For me, it, it, it's the, the, it's the, the it, it means, it seems to, it comes across to me as, you know, we're in, in, in the dark times, in the times where we are not, not dark, in, no, there's no evil, no darkness, in depression, in dark when we don't know anything, when we don't know it, when we have no opportunity to know it, it is there. And then when the light of dawn comes, when it's there, you don't have to, you don't have to be anywhere or do anything for it. So it's it's that this is what that kind of stands that stands talks to me about. It is the standard for all things. It removes all suffering. I mean that's a real kind of full fledged Buddhist line. You know it relates back to the four noble truths about dukkha. But there is dukkha. Uh, there is you know there is the uh, dukkha exists. Uh, we we are there is a path that leads there, there is a recognition of dukkha and there's a path that leads out of dukkha and that's all in that in that kind of line you know it it is a standard for all things it removes all suffering the only thing that removes all suffering is it 
what is it? Well, it is something that we can't do anything to bring about. Like facing a precious mirror, form and reflection behold each other. Form and reflection. There again is the line from Dongshan's five ranks. You know, uh, although it is, it's a, it, it is a standard, although it is not constructed, it is also beyond, it's beyond all words. There again is another, uh, if you want another Wittgenstein line, Wittgenstein says, uh, uh, thereof you cannot speak, uh, whereof you cannot speak, thereof you must pass over in silence. And I think that's more or less what is being said there. Is, you know, although it is not constructed, it doesn't, it isn't, it isn't made, it isn't constructed, it doesn't come into being. We do, we do, but it doesn't. It is always, it is always there. Like facing a precious mirror, form and reflection, behold each other. It be a form and reflection, behold each other. That is the, the you know, the conditional and the ultimate are inseparable sides of this existence that we live. They're two inseparable kind of ways in which we're looking at it. And the final, final line I want to focus on in this poem is the, the, the kind of punchline, if you like, at the, the end of this bit, it goes on, it says, you are not it, but in truth, it is you. You are not it, but it is you. I mean, that, that that fills up the whole and uh, uh, the whole puzzle of the the standards that go before it. That fills up all the standards that the stanzas that go before it. You are not it, but in truth, it is you. You know, it's like don't we can't do anything about this. This is this is where we are. This existence. We didn't ask for it. We don't do anything for it. It exists. And yet we are kind of completely always searching for something to satisfy it when it is already satisfied. So that's the kind of, you can see the, the, the play. I, it, it's to me anyway, I can see the kind of play in that where, um, where, where uh, Tozan or Dongshan, whichever one you want to call him, is, is playing with this kind of, these ideas, playing with, you know, how do we get past the conventional? How do we get to this kind of real experience that is there? How do we get to it? How, well, you can't get to it. You can't get to it. So what's the point of it? Of it? The point of it is it is what it, it is what we are. Now in uh, in in Mo, this is this is kind of taken up by this is taken up by uh, by Dogan. In the sense, and you can tell, you know, if you if these these texts I'm quoting today, you can you can tell with Dogen, with Dongshan, with the two two um, uh, Chinese Chan masters, which I'm going to quote later. You can see they're reverting back to to, to particular Buddhist sutras. So you know, we think, and sometimes, at least I used to think, that the sutras are one thing. All the teachings that come out of it are unique teachings from particular teachers. You know, but what it ends up is that everything relates back to Buddha. Everything relates back to what Buddha was talking about, because that it thing doesn't change. So we're always, whether we know the sutras or we don't know the sutras, we're always repeating the sutras. Anyway, this is what this is what um, this is this is what Dogen says in in. And I'll quote it. I'll quote it quite. quite uh, there's a number of quotes. And I hope it didn't bore you. In other words, those who want to attain the matter that is it must themselves be people who are it. They are. They are already people who are it. Why should they worry about attaining the matter that is it? You can see if you you know. Uh, for me, anyway, I can see clearly how that relates to the the uh, the Hokkyo Zanmai. The point of it, this is that directing oneself straight for the supreme truth of Bodhi is described for the present as it. The situation. I mean, you know, he's playing. He's playing with us all the time here. 
The situation of this supreme truth of Bodhi is such that even the whole universe in ten directions is just a small, small part of the supreme truth of Bodhi. It may be that the truth of Bodhi abounds beyond the universe. We ourselves are tools that it possesses within this universe in ten directions. How do we know that it exists? We know it is so because the body and mind both appear in the universe, yet neither is ourself. Yeah, if you look at that line again, you, it goes back to the, the, you know, you can tie it in with the, the verses from uh, the Hokkyo Sun line. We know it because the body and mind are both appear in the universe, yet neither is ourselves. The body already is not I. It's, it's life moves on through days and months, and we and this this is such so poignant. This piece here is so poignant. It's life moves on through days and months, and we cannot stop it even for an instant. Where have the red faces of our youth gone? But that, that, that's very poignant for me and my age. When we look for them, they have vanished without a trace. When we reflect carefully, there are many things in the past that we will never meet again. The sincere mind, too, does not stop, but goes on, goes and comes moment by moment, although the state of sincerity does exist. It is not, it is not something that lingers in the vicinity of the personal self. E even so, there is something that is in the limitlessness, establishes the body mind. Once this mind is established, abandoning our for, former playthings, we hope to hear that we have not heard before, and we seek to experience what we have not experienced before. This is not solely of our own doing. Remember, it happens like this because we are people who are it. We know that we are people who are it. Just from the fact that we want to attain the matter, that is it. Already we possess the real features of a person who is it. We don't need anything. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to do anything. It is it. And, it, it, and so it is beyond worry. Again, we should not be surprised that the matter is it, is present in such a state. Even if it is the object of surprise and wonderment, it is still just it. And there is it about which we should not be surprised? I mean, I think that piece is so wonderful. You know, it's so linked with the with Dongshan's uh, poem. It's linked with. It goes back further, and you can see it's linked in. And we'll be we'll be seeing how it's linked in um, with with some of the things that are said in in by the old Chan masters. The, one of the things that is important to note here, I think is that here Dogan is intellectualizing, okay? Here he's intellectualizing. He's doing the bit that it says, you know, you can't put this in literary form, but he's putting it in literary form. He's, he's you know, he's talking about it, it. He's talking about it, and he's trying to put it in such a way that we can understand it. We can understand what's going on, what he's talking about. He goes on. This expression of the truth is never imperfect in expression, and it does not lack anything in expression. Even so, it, to me, it, it, sorry, seems to me that only to understand the words like that without also understanding them in the way which is not like that is to fail to master these words. Although uh, the expression of the truth of an eternal Buddha has been transmitted like that, still, when the internal Buddha listens to an internal Buddha, to the words of the internal Buddha, there should be an ascendant state of listening. And this is this is kind of what is, you know, this is this is Dogen being intellectual. Okay, this is him philosophizing about it. And so, and this is what we get in uh, this is what we get in the uh, Hokkyo Zanmai, is this play of you can say it but you can't say it. Well, I can tell you about it, but I can't express it. I can, I, can, I, can, I can point to the experience, I can point to the moon, but the finger and the moon are only conditional and ultimate. 
So he goes, he goes, he goes. So there is a there is a kind of difference between intellectual understanding and practice. And so Dogen's giving us the intellectual stuff. What is he going to give us in terms of advice on practice? If I can find it. Yeah. Let me just quote two pieces out of uh, the, the, uh, the, this, this Buddha Sutra. What happens here is that uh, Ananda is again being extremely intellectual. You know, he's, he's giving the Buddha kind of talking to in a way. And he's giving the Buddha the same talk. Well, you talk about all this stuff. You talk about all this stuff, but you're not really, you know, you're not, you're, you know, you, you haven't shown us what it is. And what happens is, what happens is that uh, that Buddha t t tells, um, he, he, I can't remember who he tells. Let me, uh, let me have a look who he tells. Rahula. He tells Rahula, ring the bell, Rahula. And so, um, Rahula rings the bell and Buddha asks Ananda, do you hear the bell? And, uh, and Ananda says, yes, we hear the bell. Do you all hear the bell? And the, 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 the community says, yes, we hear the bell. And then Buddha says, do you hear it now? This is when the ringing stops. And, and they say, no, we don't hear it now. And then he has Rahula ring the bell. And this goes on a number of times. This goes on a number of times. And, um, and in the end, this is what the Buddha says. He says, well, uh, when, when, um, when Ananda has admitted a number of times and the rest of them admitted they hear the bell now and they don't hear the bell at some point, what, um, what Buddha says is this, why, why do you talk so wildly, Ananda? And the others asked, why do you say that we talk wildly? The Buddha said, when I asked you about hearing, you spoke of hearing. When I asked you about the sound, you spoke of it. So merely about hearing and sound, your answers were ambiguous. How could they not be called wild when both the sound and its echo ceased? You said there was no hearing. If there was no hearing, its nature would have died and would be like a withered log when the bell was rung again. He goes on, I'm not going to... Uh, he said, yeah, I will, I will say this bit. I don't want to be too long here. Therefore, Ananda, in your hearing, the sound may exist or not, but this does not mean that the sound, whether heard or not, can cause your hearing to exist or not. In your delusion, you mistake the sound for your hearing and so regard the permanent as transient. You should not say that hearing has no nature when it exists apart from the conditions of disturbance, stillness, obstruction and clearance. You can see here, Buddha is talking about the it. Buddha is talking about the it. And he's talking about that existence, which never ends. It doesn't stop when we hear sounds. There's always something going on. There's always something there. There is never a, there is never a, a, a silence in that way. He ends by saying, when your body perishes and your life comes to an end, how can your nature, how can this nature vanish? For since the time without beginning, all beings have followed forms and sounds and pursued the flow of their thoughts without awakening to their pure, profound and permanent nature. Dogen takes this up in Inmo. He takes this thing up. He says, uh, and, I, and if I get the Hindu names wrong, then you'll have to forgive me. Venerable Samgananandi, whose Dharma successor in due course is Gehi Asata, on one occasion hears the bells rung in the ringing, uh, in a hall ringing when blown by the wind. And he asks uh, Gehi Asata, is it the sound of the wind? Is it the sound of the bells? Gehi Asata says, it is beyond the ringing of the wind and beyond the ringing of the bells. It is the ringing of the mind. Venerable Sang Gandhi says, then what is the mind? Geyesh Zada says, the reason it is ringing is that all is still. Venerable Sangha Gandhi says, excellent, excellent. Who, who else but you, disciple, could succeed in my truth? This is a reference, to, this is a reference by Dogen to both the Sunagama Sutra and some past Chan masters. 
Dugan says, goes on to say this, it is neither the ringing of the bell nor the ringing of the bells. It, it is the ringing of the mind. Mean, uh, this means that there is in the listener at just the moment of the present, the occurrence of mindfulness. And this occurrence of mindfulness is called the mind. If this mindfulness did not exist, how could the sound of ringing be recognized as a circumstance? Hearing is realized through this mindfulness, which may be called the root of hearing. And so he, sa so he says, the mind is ringing. This is, said D Dogen, the wrong understanding. For among those who have learned under the rightful successors to the Buddhist truth, on the other hand, the supreme state of Bodhi and the right Dharma eye treasury are called stillness and are called Dharani. The principle is that if only one Dharma is still, the 10,000 Dharmas are also still. This is a reference, by the way, to the Amadami, the Amadami uh, 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 school of, of kind of early Buddhism thought that uh, that uh, we could reduce everything to to certain particular um, certain particular uh, dharmas. The blowing of the wind being still, the ringing of the bell is still, and for this reason, he says, all is still. He is saying, and this is this now is Dogen's understanding. He is saying that the mind is ringing is beyond the ringing of the wind. The mind ringing is beyond the ringing of the bells, and the mind ringing is beyond the ringing of the mind. So this is this is kind of Dogen telling us that, you know, we can't understand this intellectually at all. We can't understand this in any way. And if we make up these kind of stories uh, that we can, for as examples or parallels or uh, parables for them, then we still are not getting something. We're still not getting something. It's beyond that. He's, he goes on to get. He goes on to say, the words "you are, are the mind moving" because uh, with, within the Inbo, there's the quote of the old story you all must know about the two monks looking at the uh, the and uh, looking at the flag waving, and one says, "Is it, is it the flag that's moving, or is it like my mind is moving?" And the other monk said, "It's not the flag that's moving; it's the mind that's moving." And what Dogen says is, the words you are, the mind moving, are fine as they are, but you could also express it as you are moving. Why do you say so? Because what is moving is moving. And because you are you, we say so because you already are the people who are it. He goes on to make a reference then to, um, to make a reference to the Hokkyo Sanmai. He goes, they are like a stone in, in, in enveloping a jewel, the jewel not knowing that it is in, in, enveloped by a stone and the stone not knowing it is enveloped by a jewel. When a human being recognizes this, this jewel, a human being seizes it. It is neither something that the jewel is expecting nor something that the stone is waiting. It does not require knowledge from the stone and it is beyond thinking by the jewel. In other words, a human being and wisdom do not know each other but it seems that the truth is unfailingly discerned by wisdom. You are not it. It is truly you. That's what I'm saying there. That's what that paragraph is. You are not it. It is, it, it is you. So we, how, do we, how do we get this into practice? So we can't, we can't make a move here and we can't do anything. And so... What is it that we do when we sit? What is it we do when we sit? You know, in, 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 the, in the Rinzai tradition, the Koan tradition, we're told we do something. And in Shinkantaza, we're told we do something else. It looks as if there is a kind of, a para, a, a, a kind of distance between these two things. And, but what Dogen is telling us here is that there is no difference between these two things. It's the focus on it that... He's talking, so he's talking about, he goes on to talk about that, and this is it. He says, wisdom is not necessarily related to having, and wisdom is not necessarily related to being without. At the same time, there is existence in the spring pines at one moment, and there is the real state of being without, as the autumn chrysanthemums 
at the moment of this wisdom as being being without the whole truth of somebody becomes doubt and all dharmas are doubt and this is what um, Dogen is talking about this is where Dogen's Shinkantaza and Koan practice come together they come together in the practice of doubting the mind of doubting the mind not asking us ourselves the question of the, the not saying oh who you know what is the mind what is the mind by just sitting and, and and thinking in that of not thinking about the mind we come to penetrate the koans we penetrate the koans by doing that by going beyond the mind we got there by going that i am breathing by going that uh, going beyond i am i am experiencing by asking ourselves the question who is experiencing who is this who that is experiencing and we don't ask it intellectually we ask it through our practice we ask who is it that is sitting on this cushion who is it that is doing this uh, zazen who is it and the answer doesn't come back there isn't an answer because we have to let go of those answers we have to let go of it and baswi uh, a, a, a Chan master says, if you want to realize your own mind, you must first look, all look into the source from which th thoughts flow. Ask yourself, what is your own mind? With an intense yearning to resolve this question. You see, that is, that's, the, that's koan practice. But it's not focusing on words. It's focusing on what is behind the eye. What is this behind the who? What is if who goes? If who disappears, who is there? When the profound question impenetrates to the very bottom, he says, and that bottom is broken open, not the slightest doubt will remain that your mind is itself Buddha. He, he says, sounds can be, and this again, he harps back on, into the, uh, the, the sutra, yet sounds can be heard, so question yourself to an even profounder level. At the very last vestige of self-awareness will disappear and you will feel like a cloudless sky. Within yourself, you will find no I, nor will you discover anyone who hears. You can see what, that's the message Buddha was trying to give Ananda. Within yourself, you will find no I that hears the bell, nor that hears when the bell stops. You will you will discover you will not discover anyone who hears and that's about it really that's about all i have to there is another one but i i think i'll i kind of me i think i've gone on too too much too too long really so anyway that's uh that's what i'm working on at the moment but all what i was what i'm what what is important to me is how that balance of teaching Zen of teaching about Zen can be brought from an experience that's beyond the practice that that we we are always trying to link with it and knowing we cannot do anything to do that but let go drop body of mind as you know those words that are repeated by Dogen over and over and over again to us and we repeat them over and over again in anything we say drop body and mind drop body and mind what does it mean to drop body and mind if we solve that if we are able to understand that the only way we will understand it is by dropping body and mind not finding a way to drop body and mind whether it be Shinkantaza or whether it be koan practice, they are not methods to drop body and mind. The, what we do is drop body and mind. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we all agree that was pretty astounding. Uh, Taikyo, sit, sit. <laughs> Sits. Yes. It, it sits. <laughs> All right. We will now take. We will now take uh, questions and uh, answers. Remember, folks at home, you can call our eight hundred number. 
No, I'm, I'm just, uh, you can uh, 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 drop me an email at uh, jundotreeleaf at gmail.com for the folks watching at home. Anyone here, you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, you again. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Better move this in. Can you hear me? How are you? I'm doing well. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. All right. Well, yeah, really mind, nice to see you. My mind is a little bit blown. Um, you're talking about both koan practice and shikintaza, dropping body and mind. I guess I don't understand how. So, are you saying that by attempting to drop body and mind, you are actually dropping body and mind, or is there a step beyond that? I don't think it's a step beyond anything. That's my. That's my. That's my. Uh, that's you know. That's what I was trying to uh, get myself to understand. Is that uh, that I can't make a step. I can't do shinkantaza. I can't do koan practice, because what happens is when we do it, we use it as a method to do something. But doing using the method to do something actually something goes goes on and that that going on is nothing to do with what i do it's just that that allows the process of dropping body and mind that's how it seems to me that's how it seems to me in my practice that that just what happens is something goes on something opens up to something something you know allows uh, allows the kind of uh, realization of transience in that, if that's uh, not to put it too intellectually, it allows the kind of process of uh, uh, of experiencing transience. Does that answer your question? Okay. So it's almost in the background, essentially. You do what you do, and then it yeah. does what it does. Yeah. Would that be yeah. a way? You do. You do what you just do. What you do. You just do what you do, and you do it with uh, with a, as much sincerity as you can muster, and not trying to go or do anything other than that. You know, I remember. Uh, I can't remember his name now, but he's. Um, let me move my legs a bit. I can't remember his name, but he's. Um, He's uh, he's um, uh, he was I think director for Sotoshu of American uh, of the American uh, wing of Sotoshu or something. Uh, Isha is it Isha someone? Gender might know, but he he did a lot of kind of work on trying to uh, trying to uh, understand himself. Uh, that you know, Zazen Shinkantaza was not uh, learning meditation. Was said, not learning meditation. I think that's a a really poignant lesson to learn. That you know, we dress up in all these clothes and we get all these cushions and we sit down on these cushions and we are doing meditation or we're doing zazen, when actually it, well, with it I was talking about, is is you know immeasurably something beyond that. Is immeasurably something beyond that, and in in one sense, our doing so is a little bit of arrogance of we can do this. Where what is this? What this experience is is beyond in measure in that way, you know. But we've got to do what we do. Is you know, it's the the bit about uh, what I said about uh, Kitagari is books. You know, you have to say something. You have to keep doing, going on and doing it because that in in some way. That is what we do. And I remember Dogen saying, you know, Dogen says in the Genji of Cohen some way, he says, you know, you don't know. When you sit, you don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going on. He says that in Ingo. He says that this process is far beyond any of anybody's effort of making an effort to do so. 
but we have to do what we do you know that's that's as simple as it is and it is you know uh, simplifying our complexities in not just you know being un be trying to be unintellectual that's not that's, that's not the game, you know, that's not the game. Being simple doesn't mean you can't, you know, you can't be philosophical. Well, look at Dogen, you know, but the simple message is you'll never get, you'll never get there by philosophizing or standing up on, on soapboxes saying this, this is, you know, this is what to do. And, you know, and making every effort we can to try and to push ourselves into an experience. You know, we cannot push ourselves into an experience. The experience is already with us. We have to find how to, how to sort of appreciate it. We have to find how to, in one sense, revere it. You know, revere our own existence in life. And the grace that is, that, that's, you know, that's been given us to understand that. Not grace in a religious sense. Grace in the fact that, you know, we get up in the morning and we breathe. Before I call on Dyson, okay. I just mentioned Serkishi is uh, sick as a dog. Otherwise, he would be here today, uh, 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 and he sends his uh, regards. Okay. Uh, Dyson, you had a question. Oh, good. That's good. Thank you for doing this. Um, uh, I, first of all, I, I like the word grace in, in every sense. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you uh, this uh, uh, immeasurable it and realization of, of it. Uh, how do you relate that to uh, uh, the realization uh, through the methodology of the Four Noble Truths and cessation of dukkha? Yeah, I think that, you know, I always get, I always get, um, Kind of where I teach Buddhist philosophy, okay? I teach it uh, as an academic subject. And, you know, the first thing you do is start off with the Four Noble Truths. That's the kind of, you know, you, you, this is a Buddhist teaching. And every time I teach them, I get to understand the profundity in them, you know, that these are not four steps at all, you know, and these are not, you know, you get, you get the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, you know, uh, independent arising, you get all the kind of stuff that comes out of these things that we can categorize and catalog into certain things. But they are all the same, absolutely the same thing. Absolutely the same thing. You cannot, I mean, I, I, I understand that the first noble truth about Dukkha, of something, some, hang on, my, uh, my battery's going. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. The first noble truth about dukkha is once one is able to understand that, then the others follow from that. And it's the same with the precepts. You know, the same with the precepts. You break the, the you can break, you know, the, the 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 eightfold path into three things: wisdom, ethics, and um, and uh, meditation. And yet, all of them involve each one of them involves all of them. For me, my personal experience, I can't keep the precepts without practice. Because keeping the precepts and, keep, and walking, you know, maintaining the Four Noble Truths, for me, is a matter of practice. Yeah, I, ca I can't theorize about them. I can't say, I can't look at every action and say, well, am I doing this right? I have to just practice and, and, uh, <laughs> and allow that practice to guide me from from the first noble truth right through to you know uh, independent arising, so I have to I have to just allow my practice to do that, and all uh, you know this again is a personal thing. All I can do is sit with sincerity. All I found I can do is sit with sincerity. What the, this talk came out of. You know, an idea that I would, when I was in Zen River, that I would actually take on a koan. And I did some reading before I took on this koan. I thought, I don't need to re read the koan. And that wasn't an arrogance. 
that wasn't an arrogant thing at all. That wasn't. What struck me deeply, what struck me deeply about that was this, you know, the, the, there is no practice that can, that can allow you to understand it. There is no practice. You have to be it and you are not it. So you have to just practice with sincerity to ensure that you do what you can do. And that's as much as I can I can do, you know. And that's, you know, I don't know whether that answers your question, but sure. that's the kind of, you know, the Four Noble Truths for me are not, uh, are just truths. Thank you. They are not steps towards a truth. Okay, that, did you hear that? Or was that silence not heard? Just, okay, I, what I said was, we have a, a comment from Marina at home. She writes, outstanding indeed, exclamation point. Am I doing the practice or is the practice doing me, question mark. Thanks, Taikyo, for a wonderful talk, Gasha Marina. Uh, maybe it's a rhetorical question, but anyway, am I doing the practice or is the practice doing me? Question. I've got a very simple answer to that. Take away the question mark. If you take away the question mark. That's as much as I can say about that. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question from home. Ralph Pren. Ralph okay. writes, Hello, Taikyo. Thank you very much for your talk. My personal way brought me from reading Western philosophers first to the Buddhist scriptures. Thank you for helping me, bringing those two to, uh, closer together. I always appreciated Wittgenstein's way of defining language and describing processing of thoughts within and depending on language. I feel many parallels in reading Dogen and somehow sitting and Dharma readings solve questions. Wittgenstein left in my mind as you described can you recommend buddhist parentheses buddhist readings i guess that means buddhist or non-buddhist readings that help deepening this deep vows yeah i don't know what um uh, i don't think it's it's not always a good thing to start off by reading um uh, papers there you know we there are a lot of uh, there was a lot anyway there's not so much now but there was a lot of interest uh, about 10 years ago and there is still still interest but there was quite a flurry of interest about 10 years ago in terms of comparing Dogen with uh, with Wittgenstein and comparing you know um, and comparing Zen with Wittgenstein and I think you know it was it's often just that just scholars trying to look to publish a paper on something which has not been published before so but um so i wouldn't start off necessarily by reading papers that make those comparisons what i would do is make my own comparisons by reading wittgenstein and reading dogen uh because uh, Wittgenstein was not a, he was not he, he wasn't into Zen, but he was an extremely extremely principled and religious guy, you know, religious not in the uh, not in following a religion. 
he was very he was a spiritual person you know he was spiritual he he wanted to take on life and he wanted to um he wanted to go to push life to its its ultimate so he could get to the truth for example he wrote a, 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 if anybody knows wittgenstein he wrote uh, an incredibly impenetrable first book called the tractatus logical philosophicus which is fundamentally uh, a, a bunch of uh, logical propositions trying to demonstrate the links between language and reality and he wrote that in the first world war on the front line he was his, his parents were extremely uh, they were the richest family in austria at the time and he it, he insisted on going to war in the first world war he was austrian he insisted going to war and when he was kept away from the fighting because of his you know his his, his kind of status in austrian society he 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 insisted and was successful insisted to go and fight on the front line because he wanted to face uh, face life in that way and face death. So, and all, th throughout his life, he was constantly in search of truth, and he wouldn't take he wouldn't take like Dogen, he wouldn't take any bullshit from anybody. And and he he when he when the, he started when his philosophy started to uh, demonstrate there were mistakes, he moved on and did something else, you know. And fundamentally, ultimately. He, 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 um, his position is we cannot philosophize or create philosoph philosophical answers to this mystery of existence. We cannot do that. But it's the way he tries to uh, debunk, and not with respect, with great respect, debunk philosophy in terms of what philosophy can say and what it can't say. You know, he was always trying to say, you know, let's not puzzle ourselves with language. Let's not bewitch ourselves with language. Let's just get on with life. You know, and and uh, and that was that. So you know, reading an introductory book on Wittgenstein can tell you lots about that. But I wouldn't, um, uh, unless you have some background in philosophy, it might be quite difficult because he is one of the most difficult philosophers that you uh, in the you know in the philosophical canon, certainly since the. Uh, uh, the beginning of the 20th century but if uh, if you send me an email I'll, I'll I'll certainly send you some some stuff on it if if that's if that's what you want I'll make sure you uh, Is that okay get in touch okay any any more uh, from the uh, the folks here now's your chance Now's your chance. No. Okay, just giving a less. Well, uh, I think you have left us speechless, which is a, a good thing for a talk like this. Uh, all I can say <laughs> is, you know, sometimes this is like music. And, you know, a guy sits down at the piano and you can, you just recognize a, a virtuoso, you know, at the keyboards. That was, I, I just want to say, you know, I want to say, you've got it. You've got it. <laughs> well, I have to say, I've really enjoyed seeing you guys again. You know, I haven't seen most of you since, I haven't seen some of you at all, but I've, uh, I'm, I've missed all of you since America. And, uh, you know, it was such a wonderful time being together in America two years ago. And I'm sad those things don't, don't necessarily go on anymore, but hopefully they will in the future. Thank you. At, at the very least, I know how busy you are, but uh, can you at least promise me maybe, I don't know, once a year or so, let's do this? You know, we'll hook up again? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm all for it. Absolutely, right. After today, I kind of wish it was like, how about once a week? But we'll, we'll hold you to <laughs> That was just amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. All right, any uh, closing words, Taikyo, before we let you go? No, just the, just the ones I've said, you know. Keep on, keep on practicing. There was the, I was going to end with this, well, I will end with it. There's the, that, you know, if you've got to end with a kind of little Zen story, this is the good one, and it comes in one of these, uh, it's in one of these, 
Um, it's by Su Yun, he was a, a, another 19th century Zen Chan master. He says, he tells this story, but it's an old story. He says, you know, the, the monk comes to him and says, says you know, um, okay, uh, I, I, I've got nothing in my mind, you know. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the master turns around and he says, well, throw it out. And the monk says, well, how can I throw out what I haven't got in my mind? And so the, the, the teacher says, then carry it out. So I think all we can do is carry it out. Kionid, would you recite the verse to close the sutra? May the merits of these teachings penetrate into each thing in all places so that together may realize the Buddha's way. All Buddhas throughout space and time, all Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, Maha Prashna Paramita. Okay, thank you again, Taikyo, and good night, everybody. Okay, guys. Thank you. Yeah, good night. See you soon. Thank you, Taikyo. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.